how many of you um, like to watch TV commercials. Um, you know, how, how many of you were disappointed in the commercials for the Super Bowl this year? Man, I was disappointed. You spend like $10 million for 30 seconds. There's like two of them that were good. This was a bad crop this year, okay? It was a bad crop. But it made me think about, uh, there was a Sprint commercial, and the Sprint commercial's got a guy on it, little good-looking guy, little, little dude with the brown hair and the glasses, and he's now speaking for Sprint, but he used to speak for who? For Verizon, remember that? And way back in the day when Verizon was the, the big dog, and I think it probably is still one of the top two, you got all these mergers going on and stuff, but he had this commercial where he, he walked around with a phone all over the world, right? All over the United States, all over the world. And he'd walk a few steps and he'd say, what? Can you, can you hear me now? He'd walk a few steps. Can you, can you hear me now? He'd walk a few steps, right? I'm not going to fall on you guys, really. Uh, you know, and he'd say, can you hear me now? Right? And then there's the good one that, that the monkey was watching him at the zoo, right? He's walking in front of the monkey cage and he says, can you hear me now? Pretty soon the monkey picks up a banana and he's mimicking him, right? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And so the monkey is mimicking this, this uh, spokesperson and really is what we should be doing with Samuel. When we look in 1 Samuel 3 and we listen to how to hear from God, Samuel kind of shows us some major principles and we really should be mimicking those principles, okay? So we're going to do what we can to, it's a big chunk of land, but we're going to do what we can to kind of mine some of those out. But I want you to be thinking about, are you willing This is the key question. Write this down. Am I willing? We'll put it in the first person for you. Am I willing to cultivate the lifestyle and life habits so that I can hear God? Because I'm going to give you the big big enchilada. The big enchilada is God is speaking. He is not silent. Amen? God is not silent. He still speaks today. He still speaks to you and I today through His Spirit and His Word. And the big issue is... We are not listening. So the question is, am I willing to cultivate the lifestyle and the habits to hear from God, to hear from God in my life, okay? So let's jump right in. First of all, I want you to think about verses 1 through 4, that the Lord can choose to be silent, okay? Verses 1 through 4. The Lord can choose to be silent, and this is important for us to know. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not very many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak, he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel. But the key I want you to look at is verse 1, where it says, In those days, the word of the Lord was what? Was rare. Now, folks, this is not a good condition to get in. This is a condition that Western civilization, the United States being part of that, is rapidly moving towards. Okay? It's rapidly moving. This isn't a, a political speech or anything, but it's, it's no doubt that if, you, if I go downtown in Delta and I find the first 100 people of any age from birth to 110, right? And I ask them certain biblical, basic biblical questions, I believe you, I, I think, from my experience here after almost five years getting there, that the majority of Deltonians are going to fail that test. Biblical literacy is not just Delta. The cities are the same way. Anywhere you travel to is the same way. People are prioritizing the Word of God less. And as we prioritize the Word of God, we communicate to God that He has less value. He has less value. God has said in Psalms 138 that He is exalted above all things, His name and His Word. That's what the Scripture says. So when we devalue his name, when we devalue his word, we basically are telling Jesus, clam up. Don't want to listen. I'm not interested in what you have to say. And as a nation, we're starting to do those things. And it was what was going on in Israel at the time. Remember, this is during the time of the book of Judges. And four times, five times the book of Judges, it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The book ends with this in Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And when we're left to ourselves and our own particular personal philosophies and theologies, because that's the same thing, then we will go away from God Almighty. And when we go away from God Almighty, eventually God says, you don't have enough room for me in your life. You 
don't have enough space for me in your life, so maybe I need to stop talking to you. God can go silent. Now, in the military, we have a particular instrument for that. It's called the nuclear submarine, right? I love it every time I hear about another nuclear submarine being built. Love it. I hope we park it on the back door of North Korea and China, and let's put about 10 of them right up against Russia, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a patriot or anything, really. Uh, but a nuclear submarines, the thing that they're called, if you know anything about the sub communities, they're called silent killers, 100 killers, those attack subs. Because they are silent, they run deep, they run quiet, and you don't know that they're there, right? Well, we don't want our spiritual condition to be like that. We don't want to run so deep, so quiet for so long talking to God that he says, I'm good not talking to you for a little while. We have to make room in our lives. And we'll see that in the life of Samuel, that God made room, right? In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. That's because people were not seeking God. And our entire culture, we were talking about this in our Bible study this morning. You know, if you want to hear God, you have to get rid of some of the noise. I'm absolutely convinced of this, and I've been talking to some bigwigs in this. You have to get rid of some of the noise in your life and some of the distractions in your life and some of the busyness in your life, and you have to make space, right? If I want to spend time with Kayla, like last weekend, for her 18th birthday, if I want to spend time for that, I have to cut something out. I have to make time for that. So it was something for her, so we spent the weekend away, and I wasn't here because you make space for people that are important in your life, amen? We have to begin by making space in our lives scheduling in time to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We're so busy pursuing everything else that tries to make paradise here on earth. All our heart idols of approval and acceptance, of comfort, of power and control, right? We're so busy pursuing these idols in different forms. We don't call them that. We call them our 401k or we call them our supervision as a job master or we call it, you know, whatever. But we're so busy putting all of our eggs in that basket that we don't leave room for God to put other eggs in that basket. Folks, you have to take some of those eggs out of your basket that are in first place to make room for Jesus to be first place. Amen. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That doesn't mean those other things are bad. They're good things. But they become good, they go from good things to bad things when we put them in first place. That's the issue. It's not God. It's not them. It's us and where our heart's at. And if we fill our hearts with these things, then we can't fill it with the God things. Amen? We have to make room and space in our lives for Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 24, 7 says that God desires for us to know him and to reveal himself. It says this, I will give them a heart to know me. It's a promise for his people. I will give them a heart to know me. God wants us to know him, and he wants to reveal himself. Again, he continues. It says, God looked down from heaven on all mankind to see if there was any who were wise, any who would seek God, Psalms 53, 2. You see, this is the issue. If you move into the book of Chronicles, it'll tell you that the eyes of the Lord move back to and fro across the earth to look for those whose hearts are completely his so that he may strengthen them. If we are open to God, if we are seeking God, if we make space for God, he will not be silent. That is a promise from him. He desires for us to know him. He desires to speak to us. That's what his will is. That's what his desire is. That's what will happen in your life if we make space for him. Amen? The second thing I want us to see is God speaks to us and we must learn how to listen in verses 5 through 14. And this is what it says. Then the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli the priest said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Verse 6, again the Lord said, called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and, uh, and, went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Verse 7, now Samuel did not know the Lord yet, right? The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. And a third time the Lord said, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. 
Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came, I like this, right? The Lord came, and the Lord stood there. It's a very personal setup, that the Lord's beside him, that the Lord's with him, right? The Lord came and stood there and said, calling at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. Verse 11, and the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm about to do something great, or I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin that he knew about. Remember his boys sleeping with the women in the temple and stealing from the, all the stuff. They're black, and this is what God's going to say. Because of the sin that Eli knew about, his sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. When you look at this passage, verses 5, 6, 8, and 11 all tell us that God spoke audibly to Samuel multiple times seeking his attention. Now, when we think about this, I think a lot of times you talk about these things, the first things people talk to you about is, well, that's great, I believe that, Greg, but that was then. That is not now. Well, if you run around saying you're hearing God's voice audibly, and you tell a lot of people about that, they're going to put you in a padded cell and give you a lot of drugs, okay? So that may not be the plan you want to have. But I will tell you this, God is not silent, He still speaks today, and He still speaks to you and I. And so when God speaks to you, whether it's audibly or it's in your heart, and 99.9% .9 it's in your heart, but when God speaks to you, he's trying to communicate something to you. In this case, he's calling Samuel into a new life with him, where he's going to reveal his word to him. He's going to be his prophet. He's going to be his mouthpiece. He's going to speak to Saul. He's going to speak to the nation of Israel the word of the Lord. To get ready for that assignment, he has to pass this assignment first, which is to hear from God, okay? So let's look at this a little bit, and let's just think about if this is what we want to hear from God, for God to speak to us, what do we need to do? So I want you to keep in mind a few things. You can write these down. First, we need to realize that we can worship God and not know Him, at least not closely like a friend, okay? Do you believe it? You can come and you can say you're worshiping God and truly not know Him. And this is what it says, verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. How can that be? He was dedicated by his mother Hannah. He was given over to the priest. He was raised in the priesthood. He was doing the Levitical practices. He was in the temple. It says he was sleeping close to the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God was. But he didn't really know his God yet. Not really. He knew how to do the trappings of religion. He knew some about God. He knew some of God. But he didn't know everything about God. He didn't know what he needed to know. And so he did not yet know the Lord. So you and I need to approach this by saying if we want to hear from God, the first thing that you think about is we may be worshiping God and we may think we're pursuing God, but we truly are not. Because John chapter 15 tells us that if we're going to abide in Christ, if the Spirit of the Lord is going to be within us, if we're going to be close to Him, His Word and prayer and obedience and trust, are things that we're going to have to give God. We don't get to hold those things back and still be close and know God, right? Verse 3, 1 tells us that Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And verse 128 tells us on the second half that he worshiped the Lord at Shiloh, but he truly did not know the voice of the Lord yet. So the second thing you need to see is that God can be speaking to us and we may not recognize his voice. Do you ever believe that God has been speaking to you but you could not tell that it was his voice? Has that ever happened to you? Can you think of a time that the Lord spoke to you through the, his word or through another believer or through circumstances or whatever, and you knew for certain, you knew for certain it was from God? Can you think of that time? Now think of the other times that the Lord was speaking to you, probably trying to get your attention, but if you were like me, you're a little hard-headed and doing it your own way, and he couldn't get your attention can get your attention. When I used to do brakes and change oil and do stuff for my father working on something, 
and I kind of get daydreaming and, and kind of walking off the, you know, my hands were here, my body was here, but my head was somewhere else. My dad used to reach over and kind of smack on the back of the head, right? He'd say, hey, 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 pay attention. It's my fingers that are in that. And if you don't hold that open, I'm in the ER. Get with the program. Pay attention, right? Now, as a kid, I did not very much appreciate that. And I don't prescribe that as a parent, okay? But it did get my attention. And I think sometimes the Lord's trying to get our attention, but we're so busy, so caught up in our own lives, doing our own things, that we still are not making room for Him to listen to His voice. It takes time. It takes training. It takes intentionality. It takes a, a regular devotional time daily to build this relationship with the Lord if you truly want to hear from Him. There's no way to have a good marriage without spending time together a little bit and connecting at some level. You just can't have it. Same way with a parent to a child. It's the same way with God. It's no different. We, we have to make time and our schedule for him. We have to make a place for him. We have to be intentional, and we have to train ourselves to do certain things, cultivate certain habits, so that we hear the word of the Lord. Samuel's going to get a dose of that, right? Think about this as we continue on. Sometimes, like Samuel's going to be, we need a more seasoned, wise, godly mentor that helps us to hear from the Lord, right? Look at verse 9 with me, right? Verse 9, it, Eli is the one who starts telling him, right? He goes to Eli and he says, here I am. And Eli tells him, says to Samuel, go and lie down. And if he knew it was God, if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. It is a wise practice as a believer, especially if you're young in the faith or, or you just need to develop in the faith, is to spend time with a wiser usually older, not always, but more seasoned follower of Christ that can kind of help mentor you through those things to hear from the Lord, right? Samuel didn't know what he was hearing. He kept running back and saying, Eli, I'm here, I'm here. And Eli's like, go back to bed. I didn't call you. But Eli finally figured it out. Hey, guess what? What this boy's hearing is he's hearing the voice of the Lord. He's hearing from God. So he instructs Samuel go back and lie down, and when he comes and he says, here, you know, Samuel, Samuel, say, here I am, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Now, isn't that interesting that Eli is cultivating in Samuel the early habit in his life as a young boy to say, speak, Lord, I am listening. To be quiet. To listen attentively. To be with the radar screen on God to hear what he has to say. That would serve Samuel his entire life. As he goes before Samuel, I mean Saul, and then, and then the rest of the nation, it will serve him forever, right? But the other thing I want you to be thinking about a little bit is it should be the relationship that we seek, not the voice of God. Does that make some sense? If we're just listening for the voice of God, but we don't care about God, why would God speak to us? Why would he speak to us? Because we don't really want to know him, which is what really matters. We just want to hear from him about something that we care about. God, should I sell this house and move here? God, should I marry this person or not marry this person? God, should I take this job and let go of this job? We want our bucket filled, but we don't want to give anything to God of ourselves. Why would God be obligated to speak to us in that condition? He would not be. So we need to seek the relationship, not just the voice. God says in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with what? All your heart. God doesn't like part way. He'll take part way, but he won't leave you there. He's going to try to lead you and love you to full on. Okay, he wants all of you. If we want to hear from God, if we want to hear the miraculous, the supernatural, the non-mundane, if we want that experience then we really need to be seeking God with all of our heart. And if we're really going to be doing that, it's going to sacrifice something. We're going to have to make holes in our schedule to be with God. 
the ancient Christian people just like you and I that had regular nine to five jobs believe it or not I do too not just Sunday morning right but the regular people of the ancient world made time daily to be with the Lord they wrote a lot about it they would sit when's the last time you sat just to listen to the Lord God, this is my time. I'm sitting. I'm being still. I just want to hear your voice. Because that is an actual ancient practice of Christian believers. Paul did it. Other believers did. They would sit and they would listen to the Lord. They would consume his word, take in the Bible. They would meditate on the Bible. They would memorize the Bible. They would study their Bibles because the Lord's going to speak through his word, right? He's always going to speak through his word. They would pray to him, they would talk to him, and then they would make time to be still and to be quiet and to listen. What was Samuel doing here? He's sleeping. He's quiet. He's still. But there's a lot of little neat little things in here. He was near to God, being near the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's It's a symbolism of his heart. His heart was close to God. His heart desired to serve God. His heart loved God. And so he heard God. It should be about the relationship, not just the voice. But also I love about this where it says, Samuel, God initiates, right? We can seek and foster an opportunity and make space to hear from God, but we still can't make God speak to us, amen? We can open up the door and make room, and God's already told you he wants you to know you, know him, and he wants to reveal himself to you, but we still have to wait on his timing. Do you believe that sometimes God makes us wait? Man, I don't know about you, but in my life, he does. It makes you wait. And you know how I love patience, right? I am the master of patience. No. The type A personality of the bone. I don't like that. But God's saying, look, if you really want me, you need to be waiting on me. Right? You need to wait on me. How many of you ever been to a wedding? Come on. How many of you? I hope you're at least at your own. Right? How many of you have been to a wedding? Right, okay, thank you. I was wondering if you're all dead. This was a pretty dead message, you know, you're all dead or something. But but you go to the wedding, and the groom means what? Nothing. The groom means nothing, let's be honest. It's all about the bride. When I do premarital counseling, I say, hey, buddy, I pull him aside, listen, it's not about you. Whatever she and her mother and sister say, say yes, 10 bags full, and you're going to have a good life. Just do it. You know, you can stand on your head, gargle peanut butter and whistle Dixie for six months if you have to. Just do it to make them happy. Get your marriage off to the good start. So it's not about the groom, but who is it about? The bride, right? And you can tell by the whole staging of it. The pastor and the groom come in from the side. Nobody cares. They don't even notice, right? Nobody cares. They don't even notice. But the music, boom, boom, ba boom, and everybody stands and rises right? And the doors punch open in the back of the church, and here comes this cute little wonderful woman with about as much clothing off her body that weighs as much as she does, right? Her wedding dress, and she comes in with her entourage, and it's all about her, and it should be. It should be. But in a wedding, everybody waits on the bride. Everybody waits on the bride. If the bride decides to be an hour late, we're all going to hang out together. Everybody waits on the bride. And why do they wait on the bride? Because she is worth it. She is worth it. The, my favorite thing at a wedding is when the bride comes in and starts walking, and the groom turns around and sees her. About 50% of the time, those tough guys get water in their eye. Right? Because... This is what they've been waiting for. This is what they've been dreaming about. Things that are of high value, we wait for. We wait for. If I call the plumber, he's not as exciting as a bride, but if I call the plumber for my water being out and he says, I'll be there this afternoon between 1 and 4, guess who's taking the day off? I got to be there between 1 and 4. I'm waiting on him, right? Because it's important. God is more important than all those things. He initiates, he speaks, Samuel, Samuel. Did he not do the same thing for Moses at the burning bush? Moses just tending sheep. God initiates and speaks into his life and gives him a visual, a very powerful one. 
a bush that does not get consumed by fire. And Moses, take off your sandals for the ground you're standing on is holy ground. And he does it. And he speaks to him up on Mount Sinai. Joseph in his dreams, God spoke to Joseph in his dreams. He's in the jail. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And this, that, and the other. And, and God speaks through his dreams. And God gives him the truth through his dreams, right? Now, we've got to be careful with our dreams. I'm not saying that's a primary. The Word of God's primary. But God still speaks to us. He still speaks to us, right? What about Mary and Joseph when we move into the New Testament? God sends an angel to speak for him to Mother Mary. And he sends an angel to speak to him to Joseph. Don't get divorced. Don't put her aside. Don't do these things. You have the Christ child, Emmanuel, God with us. And God's important. We make room for him. And he moves in his way into our lives and he speaks, right? John chapter 14 through 16, the Holy Spirit uses the word of God to teach us and to guide us to speak truth from God into our lives. That's why it's so important for you and I to take the word of God and to consume it. Jeremiah said about the word of God, I eat it, right? John in the book of Revelation takes the scroll and he eats it. These are symbols of us taking in the word of God and making sure it's part of us. Because if it's inside here, through reading and study and meditation and memorization, if it's in here, then the Holy Spirit can bring it to light. When we have an issue in our lives and we're praying about that and we're seeking His face, then He can bring it up and apply it to our lives. If we don't spend time on it, how are we ever going to hear from God? It's important. God initiates and speaks to us. 2 Chronicles 15, 2. The Lord is with you when you are with Him. If you seek Him, you will be found by Him. If you seek Him, you'll be found for Him. God desires to meet you and reveal Himself to you to bless you so that you will know Him, right? Now, now what are some conditions here? We start talking about that. Samuel has already been set apart for the Lord. He's been dedicated by his mother Hannah to the Lord. So the first question I want you to be thinking about is, have you dedicated yourself to the Lord? Have you given yourself to the Lord? If you've never given your life to Christ, if you haven't pursued a personal relationship with Jesus, you should do so. Because it's the first step. is recognizing your sin and asking for forgiveness of that and turning away from trusting in yourself and your other heart idols and turning to trusting in Christ alone to take away your sins. That's what we often call salvation, what the Bible calls salvation. We are saved from the penalty of our sins. We're saved from the power of the sin in our life. And eventually in heaven, we're saved from the presence of that sin. And that's the first step is to become a Christian. But after that, do we stop giving ourselves to the Lord? Do we stop giving ourselves to the Lord as Christians? No. We should begin each day by saying, Lord, here I am. Your servant is listening. Speak. And then you have to make room. You have to put the right practices in place to hear that, right? And then, and then Samuel, how, what was he like? He was eager and expectant, right? Now, how many of you rolled out of a deep sleep and woke up this morning and said, hey, I'm ready to go, let's do it? No, man, we were all sleepy and lazy laying back in a rainy day. And obviously, you can tell your pastor didn't want to get out of bed this morning. I just, uh, right? But Samuel wasn't like that. When he hears... He jumps too. He snaps too. He runs to Eli. I'm here. What you need? He's eager. He's expected to hear from the servant of God, Eli. And eventually when Eli tells him it's from God, he's just as eager or more so to hear from the Lord. He's eager. He's expectant. If we want God to speak to us, we have to be eager and expectant and believe he's going to do it. Not just make space for him. Not just seek him but also believe that he's going to do it because he told you he wants you to know him and reveal himself to you. Samuel was that way. He was eager and expectant, right? So let's look at some of these things all together, right? Verse 10, the Lord came and stood there calling at other times, at, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He listened and he obeyed God. He trusted God and he knew what was best. It's not just him, right? As we go down the passage, we see this out of Eli too, right? Look at verse 17. What was it that he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, ever, be it ever so severely, 
if you hide anything he told you from me. Verse 18, so Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Now remember, was that a good message that Samuel was giving Eli? God's going to beat you up, dude. Remember how he promised you this because you were allowing your son to do that? He's telling you it's going to come true. Boy, that is not something to tell your spiritual mentor. That's not a good time, right? But listen to Eli's response. Then Eli said, at the end of verse 18, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his own eyes. Even Eli, the bad father that allowed these horrible things to go on, even he trusts in the goodness and the greatness and the graciousness of God. Even when judgment is coming against him and his house, and we're going to see it in the next few chapters, Eli still says, whatever it is, let God do it. What's good in his own eyes. Now, that's instructive for us. Samuel says, here I am, Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. And he receives the message of the Lord. When God gives him a word, and he has it, when Eli receives that word, even though it's a judgment against him, Eli says, so be it. You know why? Because he trusts God. He trusts that what God does is out of love. He trusts that what God does is out of justice. He trusts that what God does is right. Now, how many of us today would have that good of an attitude? Your line is going to die at an early age because of your sin. Sign me up, God. I'm good. But Eli teaches us that whether it's good or bad, it still comes from the hand of the same good, just God. Amen? Amen? We have to accept the good and the bad both from God because God's right and he's good either way. Amen? Amen. The scriptures say that he sends the sun and the rain on the good and the bad both. It's a symbol of the good things and the tough things. But when God sends the tough things our way, it's meant to discipline us. It's meant to turn up the heat a little bit. It's a little bit of a whack upside the head. Pay attention so that we get back on track. It's not meant to be harsh or evil. It's meant to move us back onto his agenda, right? So so Samuel listened and obeyed God. He trusted God because he knew God knew what was best, and Eli did too. And he demonstrates this, this attitude of, obeying God and trusting God and what he says. It is, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. And finally, I think the last thing we're going to see here in verses 19 is that God reveals himself primarily through his word. And I want you to see this. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. He let none of Samuel's words fall on the ground. Verse 20. And from Israel to Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. Verse 21, and this is the key one. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his what? His word. Everywhere you see the Spirit working, you see the Word of God working. Everywhere you see the Word of God working in the biblical text, you see the Spirit of God working. They are just like this, always together. That's why when someone comes to me and says, I had this vision, blah, 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 da, 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 God's telling me to do this, the very first thing I usually say is, And where does that go along with what the scriptures say? There's nothing wrong with you having a vision. Nothing wrong with God speaking to you. But if it doesn't match the biblical text, it isn't God speaking to you. See, the Bible also says that Satan appears in the book of Corinthians as an angel of light. And he seeks to deceive us because we think that what he is saying is from God. It is critical, just like Samuel. Samuel actually heard audibly heard the word of the Lord, but it says that he himself, God revealed himself to Samuel through his word. He does the same thing for you and I. We have to make space for God. We have to move things intentionally off our agenda and out of ourselves, our noise and our distractions and our busyness. We have to believe God when he says that he wants to reveal himself and for us to know him, and we have to be eager and expectant. And when we got to make space, we sit down and we're quiet before the Lord and we say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, and be serious about it. And then we have to take whatever he tells us. But everything that in that experience is hinged upon this. It has to be based upon being in this word. Whether it's in a printed form or you're electronic, I don't care. It's still the word of God or it's oral, it doesn't matter. 
as long as it's the Word of God, the Scriptures, the Bible. And you have to base your experience out of that. Not out of your prayer life alone. Not out of what you think God's telling you. Because it could be a deception of a demon. It has to match that book. Now, if what God's telling you matches that book, then by golly, you better get on that train and get moving. That's the right place to be. And there's no sweet spot than to be in the center of God's will. If Calvary's going to move forward, we're going to have to stay in the center of God's will of preaching, teaching, and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. we got to do it. It's just the way it's got to be. So let's sum this all up together, okay? Let's sum this all up together. I want you to leave with this thought up on your minds. Psalms 32, 8 through 10. God makes his promise to you. Whoa. That was not the Lord speaking. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. You hear that? His loving eye on us. Do not be like the horse or the mule which has no understanding, which must be controlled by bit or brittle, or they won't come to you. Right? Instead, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. If we are like Samuel and make space for God, if we make place in our daily lives for the Lord, if we include his word and prayer and sitting before the Lord and being quiet and listening to him, if we seek his heart and his face, God promises that he will instruct us and he will teach us in the way that we should go. And it will all be